Earning your blood rights is how you became a man as a Comanche warrior. They had to shed blood in both the hunt and in war. It was part of their custom, an unbreakable part of culture, deeply ingrained and reinforced by all of their beliefs. There would be no changing. Constant war had been part of the Comanche way of life for centuries. This is something the Texans learned as they moved into the territory on the fringes of Comancheria. This Comanche barrier slowed western migration for decades. Constant raids left settlers butchered and bloodied. In some years, hundreds were killed. Over the decades, thousands were captured. Prisoners to be taken back to the plains. Farms were burned and property was destroyed. In this episode, we are going to follow the Comanche to see what it was like on one of their most devastating raids, the slaughter of Elm Creek in 1864. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. Into the 1850s, things had changed for the Comanche. For the first time since they had mastered the horse, they were being forced on the defensive. Expansion by the Americans led to problems for them on the plains. The Texans were a tougher group of fighters than their Spanish predecessors. Rangers adopted Comanche tactics like mounted fighting, and new technology like the Colt revolver finally gave the Americans a weapon that could compete with the firing rate of the Comanche bow. Disease devastated the southern Panatica band, and certain groups of Comanche, those physically closest to the Americans, were considering walking the white man's road. A phrase meaning to stop raiding and begin settling and practicing agriculture. The idea of practicing agriculture was among the most detestable by the Comanche, especially the young warriors. Most continued to resist. Even with the successes of the Americans, the Comanche barrier continued to block aggressive expansion, especially as settlers moved west to their true home on the Bison Plains. But pressure was mounting. That is, until 1861, when the Americans started fighting each other. The Civil War led to big changes in the way that the Texans were able to police their frontier. Thousands of military-aged men were pulled from the region to fight against the Union. Both Union and Confederate governments promised gifts and support to the Comanche if they would stop raiding and begin farming. Certain bands even signed the treaty, but as was often the case, the Indian agencies failed to deliver what they had promised. Further, by 1862, it had become apparent to the Comanche that the borderlands between them and Texas had changed. They were softer than they had been in previous years, quiet and undefended. Attacks that had declined over the last decade started to pick up again. By 1863, the Comanche were causing havoc and raiding with impunity. Historian T.R. Fehrenbach wrote that, quote, By 1863, many northwestern counties were under virtual siege, end quote. Cattle thefts and murders grew common. The population was again terrorized by the Comanche, and they were powerless to stop them as their frontier crumbled around them. And in 1864, a Comanche war chief would arrange the largest single raid in over two decades. Little Buffalo, a Comanche war chief, one of the few left, waits for a sign. War for the Comanche was governed by medicine and custom. Without a sign, there would be no war party. A sign could come from visions or events seen in nature. A war chief, praying to the eagle spirit, might see a fierce bird descend upon a rabbit. This might be the sign to make war. In telling others of his plan, Little Buffalo would have to convince them that his medicine is strong and that his puha, or power, would ensure their protection and success. We don't know what Little Buffalo saw, but he must have convinced them that his puha was great because he was able to amass hundreds of warriors to his cause something that had been growing increasingly rare before the Civil War left the frontier less protected. For young warriors, an opportunity to raid was not one that they took lightly. Killing an enemy was part of a young man's courage right. It was essential to becoming a man. A man who hadn't shed blood in both the hunt and in war would be mocked by his tribe and laughed at by children. He would be branded a coward, and cowards were not tolerated among the Comanche. War was deeply embedded in their culture as a system of honor. Before the party left on the war path, they held a war dance. Comanche culture had few ceremonies, but the war dance was immensely important. The warriors would gather around a blazing bonfire. Their faces would be painted black, the color of death. The dance consisted of stomping, chanting, and leaping. The warrior battle cry would be repeated as the women in a circle around the men cheered them on with equal enthusiasm. It was Comanche custom to leave for a raid at night, often under a full moon. Little Buffalo's war party was no different than a traditional raid. In the fall, the grass had long been grown, food for the party's horses. 
Each warrior, to keep them fresh, would bring at least three. Under the feared Comanche moon, his party took off into the darkness toward Elm Creek, each warrior seeking the glory of the raid. By 1862, a year after the Civil War started, over 60,000 young men in Texas had been sent to war. Less than 30,000 were left in the state, and their lack of presence was felt quite quickly by the Comanche. As mentioned previously, it didn't take long for the Comanche to figure out that the Texas frontier was not the formidable line it had been just a couple years prior. They immediately began to take advantage. The raids coming down on Texas were described as an outbreak. Texans were dying by the hundreds, and for maybe the only time in the history of the United States, we saw the line of frontier retract. Inhabitants moved east in mass because they feared Comanche raids. In some places, the frontier contracted 200 miles. The governments could do nothing to protect them. The settlers who remained tended to be stubborn holdouts. Handfuls of families manned fortified locations in the region during times of trouble, but even they were shorthanded during these years as was the case with Elm Creek in October of 1864, when Little Buffalo's massive war party arrived on their doorstep. The morning of October 13, 1864 was beautiful. The 14 families inhabiting the Elm Creek area went about their morning doing their daily labors. They were completely unaware of what was coming. Little Buffalo led his party of several hundred mounted warriors down the Brazos River just below the mouth of Elm Creek. The first settlers they encountered were a father and two sons. Armed, they ran off into a section of cross timbers. The Comanche didn't like to attack fortified locations. Killing the men would have been easy, but not without suffering their own casualties. The Comanche only liked to fight when it was a position of advantage. It would have been a bad way to start the raid. With little to gain, they move on with only a minor skirmish. Mr. Myers, a man living near Fort Belknap, was less lucky. The Comanche found him while he was out looking for an escape docks. He was quickly overwhelmed. The Comanche killed and scalped him, leaving his body in the field where they found him. The Fitzpatrick house was located near the mouth of the river. The war party approached with caution. They didn't know what they would find inside. Before they could get too close, a white woman carrying a rifle came barging out of the house, yelling and screaming at the Indians. She made the mistake of firing her rifle while the Comanche were too far away. The shot either missed or bounced off one of their buffalo hide shields. Before she could reload, several eager warriors had rushed her, filling the poor woman full of arrows before scalping her and taking her gun. She was left like a pincushion in the yard in front of the house. Inside, the Comanche found three more women and five children. They were unarmed and terrified. Seven were taken captive by the Comanche. They were disrobed and strapped to the horses. All except one child, a 12-year-old boy who was fought over by two of the warriors, each of them claiming him as their own prize. Unable to come to an agreement, they dispatched the boy so that no one could have him. Captives were often expendable, and the Comanche had to continue moving. They started to head west to the home of the Hambies. Here is where they will find their first real resistance. At this point in the raid, everything was going smoothly for the Comanche. Only the three men who had fled into the cross timbers had put up any real fight. Rather than risk taking them on from behind cover, the band just moved on. But when the Fitzpatrick house was taken, the band grew bolder. Young warriors wanting to prove themselves and take loot from the raid started to become more aggressive. The party began to move west from the Fitzpatrick house and closer to the home of the Hambies. The band broke up into several groups. As they headed to the Hamby house, the band was confronted by Thornton Hamby, a Confederate soldier on leave after an injury, and his father, the Elder Hamby. They were prepared. Both were on horseback and well-armed. The Comanche warriors kept back from the two men. The Hambys were smart. If one fired their weapon, the other wouldn't. The Comanche would have rushed in, like they did with the woman before, if both of their guns were ever emptied. The warriors tried to surround the Hambys, but they were retreating slowly. They knew that they were no match for the dozens of warriors in front of them. Some warriors screamed at them, parading toward them on horseback, weaving in and out of range, trying to get them to flee so that they could run them down. Another group of Comanche found the house of Judge Williams. He was away on business. His family hid in a nearby thicket, silent and still, praying not to be found as the Comanche ransacked the home. A witness, Henry Williams, just a boy at the time and the son of the judge, wrote much later about what he saw in hiding. Quote, the Indians robbed our house and tore up everything there was in it and destroyed all of the provisions. 
bedding, and clothing, but failed to find these helpless women and children." End quote. This was common in Comanche raids. When they loot, they destroy or burn anything they don't wish to take with them. Anything of value from bedding to the mass slaughter of cattle. The first group, trailing the retreating Hambies, collided with the second. The Comanche watched as from the west they were joined by a third man on horseback. Doc Wilson had previously run off to warn as many of the nearby houses as he could. He now returned as the Comanche horde was bearing down on the other men. Before they could be overrun, the three men turned their horses and made a desperate effort to run to the closest house they could fortify themselves in, the Bragg Ranch. This is what the warriors had been waiting for. Turning your back on the Comanche was known as a death sentence on the plains. Comanche Mustangs were fast, and as the three men raced their horses toward the cabin, the warriors were gaining ground quickly. As the three men approached the Bragg Ranch, they leaped off their horses and ran toward the small cabin. They weren't fast enough. Doc Wilson held the door as Thornton and the elder Hamby ran inside. Before he could follow, he was struck in the heart by a Comanche arrow. A warrior's blood rite had been fulfilled. As the Comanche let out resounding war whoops, Doc stumbled inside. There, he pulled out the arrow, coughed up blood, and then expired on the dirt floor as the Hambies barricaded themselves inside, the full force of the Comanche war party outside the walls. As the Comanche rode up on the home of the Bragg family, they behaved differently than they typically would. The house was a small two-room cabin, but built to be able to hold up for at least a short period of time in case of attack. Usually, a war chief would look at a situation like this one and move off. But the bloodlust of the warriors had grown with their earlier successes. Little Buffalo had eager warriors who wanted to prove themselves. Gunshots started to ring out toward the Comanche from inside the cabin. Thinking that the rifles of the men were now empty, the warriors would race toward the walls and windows to try to break in. Hitting an enemy with an arrow would satisfy blood rights of Comanche warriors, but touching an enemy held special honor. The French called it counting coup. It was common practice among Plains peoples like the Comanche and the Lakota. Even a wounded enemy was dangerous. Touching the enemy and taking a trophy demonstrated exceptional bravery and provided status for the warrior seeking it. But as the Comanche rushed the house, more shots would come from inside. What they didn't know is that there were women inside the house too. They were there when the Hambies arrived, a handful of them, terrified having heard the shots and screams from earlier in the morning. As the elder Hamby and Thornton were shooting, the women were frantically reloading for the men. For the settlers, this was a fight to the death. They knew what would happen to them if they were captured. If the Comanche captured the men, they would be brought back to the village where the women would ritually torture them to death. The Texan women would share the fate of those already captured. They would become slaves, in every sense of the word. Shots continued to come. Some warriors retreated before reaching the walls, darting on horseback in and out of range. Others were shot as they approached too recklessly. The Comanche would collect their injured and dead. It was important to them that their enemies not truly know how much damage they had done. Little Buffalo, the war chief guiding the mission, hadn't called off the attack. He himself participated, demonstrating to those in his party his own bravery and leadership. But then the tide changed for the war party. Maybe by a lucky shot or by deliberate aim, Little Buffalo was shot from his horse. The death of a war chief showed that their medicine had failed. If there was no medicine, the party would not be protected. It was custom to move on. A sign. For the settlers in the house, this came just in time. The elder Hamby had been injured by repeated Comanche assaults and was out of the fight. Most of the women hid under the beds, terrified of what would happen to them if the Comanches made it past the walls. Thornton had received several wounds from arrows. He was fading and desperately trying to hold on to the fight. But just as soon as they came, the Comanche were gone. It was Comanche custom that following a raid, the return home was fast and deliberate. They would usually ride northwest, back to Comancheria. They would keep moving, well into the night, by the light of the moon. All of their loot would be taken with them. Prisoners would be strapped by leather thongs to the backs of horses. The horses they had stolen would be driven by the riders with the Comanche. The war party would spread out. A large party would break up into many small groups to confuse pursuers and keep the majority of the party safe from ambush. As they rode, they might encounter stragglers. On this raid, they ran into a Mr. McCoy and his son on a prairie. Like the other victims, they were killed and their scalps were taken. Back in the village, they would be dried and displayed on poles. Fifteen Texas Rangers, returning on the Peace River, ran into one of the groups of Comanche riders. They were no match for the massive party. Five of the Rangers were killed, and the others were lucky to escape with their lives. 
The raid at Elm Creek was the prototypical Comanche raid. They came in unseen by the light of the moon. They killed and looted. They took prisoners and trophies. And when the resistance they faced showed their medicine wasn't protecting them any longer, they didn't push their luck. They left as fast as they came, leaving death, destruction, and terror in their wake. Thank you for watching the video, and if you enjoyed it, like and subscribe, or leave a comment. I don't know for sure that it helps channel growth, but I hear it does, and I would like to see that happen. And if you wanted to know what happens to the captives that were brought back to the Comanche camps, take a look at this video. It's not pretty.